So we're continuing with the uh, third Elijah message. And the third Elijah message is, uh, uh, we've looked at clearly that the third Elijah, the first Elijah was John, I mean, um, Elijah the Tishbite. The second Elijah was, uh, according to Jesus, John the Baptist. And the third Elijah is nobody else but the person of Jesus Christ, who has given us the ultimate truth and revelation of God. And as we are going to follow Jesus, what he began in us, he will complete in us. And as we listen to what Jesus uh, has taught, then we will become the people as a group and giving the third uh, Elijah message. But the third Elijah himself is nobody else but the person of Jesus Christ. And with that, we're going to now go to Revelation chapter 14. And we'll start from verse 6. And keeping in mind what we have uh, looked at in Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. It's pivotal and extremely important that we know what is stated very emphatically in verses 1 to 5 in Revelation 14. If not, then when we go into Revelation 14, 6 and onward, we will not be fulfilling the commission that I believe God has uh, given us to fulfill. You cannot fulfill the commission that God has given us. Impossible to fulfill it unless Revelation 14 verses 1 to 5 has been fulfilled in us. And we're going to look at this in the context of what, what is going to be uh, developing here this morning. With that, I want us now to look at uh, chapter 6 of Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Sorry. Then I saw another angel, and keep in mind, dear ones, it doesn't mean that this is a literal angel. It is referring to messengers or messenger, and it is applying to people that will be living at this stage in the history of the world that will be giving this message. And it states, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. I believe that in the midst of heaven also refers to the entire communication system that is in place like never before. We've got the communication system in place for this message to be given to the world. So, the, uh, flying in the midst of heaven, and what is these messengers giving? Having the everlasting gospel. What do they have? The everlasting gospel. If you go throughout the entire Bible, well, especially if you confine yourself just to uh, the New Testament. In the entire New Testament, for the first time in the entire New Testament, the gospel is prefaced with the word everlasting or eternal. What does that mean? Why wasn't it stated there? But in, the, in this context, it is clearly telling us it is the everlasting gospel or it is the eternal gospel because of what was fulfilled in people in Revelation 14 verses 1 to 5. You cannot preach or give the everlasting gospel if Revelation 14 verses 1 to 5 is fulfilled in us. Impossible. Why? Because we will not be giving the true message for this end time. Impossible to give it. And people might claim that they are giving it, but they are not giving it if Revelation 14, 1 to 5 is not fulfilled in them. And then it tells us, what is this everlasting gospel? To be preached to those who dwell on the earth. To preach to every human being on the face of the earth. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Entire human race. And Jesus, in, in Matthew 24, 14, stated, and this gospel of the kingdom 
What gospel? The, go the everlasting gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. So here what John is stating and has written applies to exactly what he had learned from Jesus himself. But here he gives and defines it to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, which means to say that this everlasting gospel will not be preached or taught in some very timid way. Not in pride, but with God's boldness, this message is to be proclaimed. Having with a loud voice. Now when it said in verse uh, 6, having the everlasting gospel in them. If we don't have the everlasting gospel in us, it's clearly stating having. So if you don't have the everlasting gospel in you, if it is not sealed in our mind, if we have not understood what the everlasting gospel is, you cannot give what you don't have. But here it is clearly told what? That they have it. Having the everlasting gospel. To every nation, tribe, tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice. <clears throat> now here. <clears throat> we look at verse 7. Fear God and give glory to him. What do you think this word fear here means? Is it the word fear? Fear. That is referring to us in abject fear, hiding from God like Adam and Eve hid from God when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Is this the kind of fear that this is referring to? Or is this a word that can also mean that you are so enthralled with God, you are in, literally in awe with what God has done in the everlasting gospel, the eternal gospel, that we are in literally in awe of him, not the negative fear. How we, do, how we know that it cannot be the negative fear? To make sure that we understand this correctly, I'm going to look at 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 17, 18, 19, and 20. Love has been love. Uh -uh, I'm getting an echo from the computer. Yes. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world now verse 18 there is no fear in love there is no fear this negative fear in agape love none if we have any kind of a fear then we have not understood the eternal gospel we have not understood God's agape love okay there is no fear in this love but perfect love casts out fear why because fear involves torment fear if you look at the word torment in the Greek fear involves punishment but he who fears has not been made perfect in love we love him because he first loved us with this knowing that uh, that this first angel has clearly told us what we are to be doing. Fear God and give glory to Him. How do we give glory to God? What do you think? What goes through your mind when you think in terms of giving glory to God? You cannot give glory, you cannot give glory to God unless what? You know His agape love. You cannot glorify God 
to glorify God, you must have the agape love of God in us. And the only person that has given us that revelation is nobody else but the person of Jesus Christ. So it clearly tells us, giving, I mean, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. The hour of whose judgment? His judgment. Who is the his? What do you think? What goes through your mind in that? The hour of his judgment has come. And surprisingly, the New King James Version hits it right on. The his, H-I-S, is capitalized. The hour of his judgment has come. Whose judgment? Would you believe that the hour of God's judgment has come? And how is it that God's judgment has come at this hour? To make sure that we understand what this hour of God's judgment means, I'm going to make sure that we don't misunderstand this. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 tells us, What, uh, I'm reading from verse 1. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? With their unbelief, make the faithfulness of God without effort? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a lie, as it is written. And here, here we go in verse 4. And as it is written... That you, God, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Who is Paul saying in here that when you are judged? Who's the you that is going to be judged? God. God. Very clear. How and why is God being judged. Jesus made a very important statement in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, and we're looking at verse 43, John chapter 12 and verse 43, in, in, in the context of what we have just read. And in verse 43, then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me Believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees me, sees him who sent me. We, I'm not going to go and define and explain all the details. I believe it is, it is self-explanatory. If you look at it, what Jesus is trying to tell us is that if you have seen him, you have seen the Father, if you know him the way he should be, Known, you will know the Father the way the Father should be known. If you have seen me, you have seen uh, my Father also. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Verse 48. Verse 48 is important for us to grasp. In verse 48, it clearly tells us, this is Jesus speaking, dear ones. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. So what is going to happen to us? We are going to be judged on the basis of what? If we reject Jesus Christ's teaching, the very word that I have spoken to you, will what? Judge you when? In the last days. This is so grave, so important, that if Jesus is not the central being, the central person, 
in the entirety of our understanding of the Holy Scriptures, then we are rejecting His words. And when we reject His words, judgment will follow. The words that I have spoken to you will judge you in the last day, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. All this is referring to the end time when the very words that Jesus spoke will be judging us. And I know that his command is what? Everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So here we are clear that the hour of his judgment has come. So what happens? The way God and Jesus is judging all of us, especially for the end time, they are also being judged. The way they execute judgment, they are also being judged. And Jesus made it very clear that the, that the very words that he has spoken, the very words that he has taught, the very revelation that he has given, will be how we are going to be judged. And then it says, and give glory to him for the hour of judgment has come and worship him. Now here we are clearly told to worship who? Worship him. And who is the him here? It's referring to the creator. Worship him who did what? Who created the heavens, who created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And we had a bit of a discussion last Sabbath on the day of worship. If we look at what is stated here, especially for the end time, and he's talking of worshiping who? The creator God. And what did he do? He created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The creator created seven days. In seven days he created what he created. On the seventh day, what did he do? He rested. He created the Sabbath on the seventh day. He didn't create the Sabbath on any other day. But the Sabbath, seventh day, it's tied up here with the everlasting gospel that we must worship him, the creator, and the day that was specifically set aside for worship was the seventh day. For this, I want us now to pay particular attention to Jesus as the Creator, And we're going to look at a few verses to make sure that we understand who is the Creator. And I'm going to use the Bible to show that who is the Creator. For that, I want us to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. And we're looking at verses 1 and onward. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Very clear what he has done. In time past, he spoke to us by the prophets. But here, what he says. Verse 2. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son. In these last days, God is speaking to us through nobody else. He spoke to us through the prophets previously, but in these last days, he's speaking to us from no one else but the person of Jesus Christ. Whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Through whom? Through Jesus. Jesus is the creator who being the brightness of God's glory, of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. 
having become so much better than the angels. And he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I'm going to look at John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And the next verse that I want us to look at is Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and I'm going to read from verse 9. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Keeping in mind that who created the heavens and the earth and, and the person who did the whole of creation, the Bible is very clear as the person of Jesus Christ. And why I'm emphasizing all of this is to make sure that we come to the realization that for this end time, God is speaking to us through no one else but the person of Jesus Christ. How do we know this? On the Mount of Transfiguration, which is a miniature second coming of Jesus Christ. On the Mount of Transfiguration, he made it very clear. Moses and Elijah was there. And Peter wanted to bring three tabernacles. God the Father cut Peter right there and then and said, No, I don't want three tabernacles. I just want one tabernacle. I don't need a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah. I will need one tabernacle and one tabernacle alone. And that is who? My son. You listen to him. You hear what my son has to say, especially for the end time. So verse 9 of Colossians chapter 1. For this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, the knowledge of God's will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering, with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us. He, Jesus Christ, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom. I mean, I'm sorry, he is God. Has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And this is Paul writing. If anyone knew what Paul knew, that's why he could write the way he did. Verse 15, Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth visible and invisible, where the thrones of dominions of principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead in all things he may have pre eminence in all things bar none in all things Jesus Christ must have the preeminence for it pleased the father that in him in Jesus Christ all the fullness should dwell nobody nobody had this fullness of God in them except for the person of Jesus Christ And it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him, and by Jesus Christ, to reconcile all things to himself by Jesus. No one else can reconcile everything to God except through the person of Jesus Christ. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, 
having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through dress to present, pay particular attention to this passage here now, this section, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. What? Is Paul gone out of his mind? What is he saying? That what we are going to be? To present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. For this, I want us now to look at chapter 14. I'll look at verse 1 first. Chapter 14, verse 1, in the light of what we have just read. Then I looked and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having. What do these people have, these 144,000? These people have his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. What do they have? They have Jesus' name and Jesus' father's name written on their forehead. What does that mean? They have the seal of God in their mind. And what is the seal of God? Jesus himself said that God the Father has set his seal on him. Jesus Christ is the seal of God. Nobody else. No institution, no day, nothing is the seal of God. The seal of God is the person of Jesus Christ. And when we follow and obey Jesus Christ, we receive the seal of God. And we have his father's name sealed. His name and his father's name sealed on our forehead. <coughs> Pardon me. And verses 4 and 5. These are the ones who are what? Who have the father's name and Jesus' name sealed in their foreheads. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, be his friend foods to God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. They are what? Blameless, without fault. In what? What? Are they blameless and without fault? And what is it that they have the seal of God and Jesus' seal in their forehead? They don't end up with the mark of the beast principle because the mark of the beast is also where? In their head and in their right hand. This group of people know Jesus and his revelation of his father's character. This group of people are sealed and that's how they can proclaim the three angels' message. You cannot proclaim the three angels' message unless you have this seal of Jesus and the Father on our head. And that's what I have been attempting to do here for the last nine months. I have not ceased Sabbath after Sabbath. Every teaching, everything that I have done I have not held back in sharing this truth that Jesus Christ is the one and only him alone should be the final person that we should be completely focused on to know the truth for this end time. 